Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Please stand for our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Melanie Baker. I'm Associate Director of the Institute of Catholic Culture, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight. I am here and not Deacon Sabatino because his wife was delivered of a new baby yesterday evening. Uh, so I, I went this morning and saw Vincenzo Antonio, and he is just too precious. Y'all will all be seeing pictures soon, but if anyone's dying for photos, they can come up and, and look at them on my phone afterwards. Vincenzo. Vincenzo Antonio. So now that's four, is three boys. They've got Mariana's the oldest girl, and then Luciano, Carlino, and Vincenzo now. So, very Sicilian. So our speaker this evening obtained his doctorate in Semitic languages and literature from the Catholic University of America. He taught at the California State University in Chico before taking up his current position as Associate Professor of Comparative Religion at the University of Illinois at Springfield. His research focuses on Arabic and Syriac literature and the history of the late antique and medieval Middle East with a special interest in medieval encounters between Muslims and Christians. He has published more than a dozen articles, as well as the book Christian and Muslim Dialogues, The Religious Uses of a Literary Form in the Early Islamic Middle East. We're just so delighted to welcome back such a respected scholar to the Institute of Catholic Culture and a personal friend of Deacon Sabatino's. And just so everybody's aware, this is a two-part series, so we're going to have the first part. We'll take a very brief break and then get going for the second and end with Q&A. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Bertena. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I'm glad that so many of you were able to make it here this evening. To, again, just to reiterate the, the structure, the first talk I'm going to give is going to set up the historical context of the Quran and its relationship to the Bible. And so there I'm going to be talking a lot about the practical and historical issues. In the second talk I'm giving, I will be discussing some practical applications of this historical information and how can we share the gospel in the context of the Quran um, and what can we say about um, conversion to Christianity in light of a 21st century context. So uh, the first part will be more historical, the second part will be more practical. So the title of the talk the Bible and the Quran. Can they both be right? Let me tell you a story. I, I take my students every semester to a synagogue and then to a church and then to a mosque. So part of our, our Western religions course. And uh, during our, our most recent visit to the mosque there, we went to the service. And following that, they had a special occasion to bring us in afterward for question and answer. Uh, one of the things uh, that the imam who was there brought up was an issue. I asked him, you know, in the Quran it says that Jesus is word of God, kalimat Allah. You know, Christ Jesus, son of Mary, is the spirit of God in his word. And if that's the case, um, how do Muslims talk about Jesus as word of God? And uh, his response was that, well, you have to remember and keep, that, keep in mind that uh, this particular understanding is, uh, must be understood in the context of uh, Surah Al-Imran, the third surah in the Quran, 
uh, in, in verse 59, which says that Jesus' resemblance is like Adam, whom God re, uh, created from dust. And then God said to him, be, and he was. And so um, immediately he was saying, well, if Jesus, uh, a word from God, is more like Adam. One of the things that was brought up by another student was, well, wait a second, is, how can he be word of God and be dust? Because isn't God something other than dust? If you say he's a word from God, isn't he part of that? Aren't you equating uh, God with dirt? Um, and so this was one of the issues that quickly said, well, wait a second. Well, how do we respond to this? And so this is one of the issues that gets to the question of Bible and Quran, I think, is this word of God is the same word. So in many ways, they are similar in their use of language, but in their interpretation, they are quite different. And so in the Bible and the Quran are at fundamental, uh, fundamental disagreement when it comes to the interpretations that their communities put upon their own texts. So that's kind of the background to uh, this talk. The Quran is a collection of revelations given to Muhammad ibn Abdullah around the years AD 610 to 632 in the Hijaz, which is the region of uh, the central west region of the Arabian Peninsula. And the mechanism of transmission of these, these revelations was oral recitation given by Muhammad, which were said to be divine words spoken through Gabriel, through the angel, to Muhammad in Mecca and in Medina. This oral recita uh, recitation is not like our written Bible, which is a, you know, a collection of different texts written by different people in different ages. Um, these recitations were given orally, and they were not written down. They were assembled after his death. This is an important point. The collection which we have, which is written, uh, is called the Qur'an. Qur'an literally meaning uh, a recitation. So it's a remembrance of an oral text that uh, was written down after Muhammad's death. It's roughly the length of the New Testament. Overall, there are 114 surahs in the Qur'an. And if you add together all of the verses, all of the, the ayat, uh, they total about 6,000, about 6,000 verses. And of course, it's not uncommon to hear of Muslims that memorize the entire Qur'an. Uh, most people who look at the Qur'an and its historical context talk about it in terms of three Meccan stages from 610 to 622, three stages of, of revelation, and they usually talk about uh, a couple of stages in the Medinan period. But there's a lack of consensus about when particular surahs were revealed. Uh, why is this the case? Um, because the surahs are arranged roughly from longest to shortest, with a few exceptions. And because of this, they're not listed chronologically. So the historical chronology of, is uh, sometimes in a matter of dispute. All of the surahs begin with what's called the basmala, that is, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, um, with the exception of Surah 9. And there are also 29 letters, which uh, individual Arabic letters, which are written down. They're disconnected Arabic letters. And the meaning of these are unknown. Um, these probably trace back to some of the earliest uh, texts of the Quran as it was being collated and put together. Now, in regards to the Quran, although it was given over the course of a shorter period of time by one person, unlike the New Testament, there are textual variants to the Quran. In general, there are fewer than the Bible because of those differences, um, and it was put together over a shorter period. But one of the issues is we don't have any uh, dated manuscripts of the Quran prior to the 8th century. Now, we have some manuscripts that might date to the 7th century, but we're guessing as far as that. So there's nothing within the first 75 years that we know of. We can say this is a dated text uh, of the Quran. So we have issues with um, understanding how it came to be. So there are two ways to approach this problem. How do we understand the Quran historically? Uh, one, which is the traditional Islamic approach, um, one that many theologians take, is the post-canonical approach. That is, to uh, uh, interpret the Qur'an after it had been canonized. And this mostly looks at the Qur'an as an authoritative text. And since it is already an authoritative text, you look at it as a finished work to search through for uh, theological themes. And then you um, defer historic interpretation issues. That is, how did it come to be? Uh, you defer those and set those aside at, uh, to focus more on uh, issues of how or what does it mean theologically. One of the weaknesses to a post-canonical or theological approach is that it tends to flatten out any differences over time because, of course, the Qur'an was revealed over the course of at least 22 years. 
So certainly uh, circumstances and situations change over the course of that time. And so um, by looking at it from a theological way in a finished fashion, it flattens it all out and smooths out any differences or contexts. Uh, usually this is called the, the, the theory of abrogation is the theory that's used. Abrogation is the um, principle in the Quran that any two issues which might seem contradictory or might not seem to fit together exactly, um, one abrogates the other. One is uh, considered to be revealed later than the other and therefore uh, more reliable. So this is uh, the way that from a post-canonical approach you, you deal with these issues. Another approach that many historians like to use, of course, is the uh, getting to understand the, the historical context of the pre-canonical Quran. That is, how do we get to 114 surahs in a finished text? Uh, and this is a historical critical approach, which is common in the Bible, and it's been common since the 19th century, but it's something that has not commonly been used in the context of understanding the Quran. That is, how did it come to be a finished text after the death of Muhammad? One of the issues that we have is that um, we need to find out and, and we can use a historical critical approach to understand how it came to be as a text belonging to a specific community. And so I want to talk about four specific benefits to a pre-canonical approach to understanding the Quran. And this is where it gets into this issue of Quran and Bible is um, the Quran shares a lot of its inspiration, a lot of its theology, and a lot of its language, its vocabulary with the Bible. And so uh, you can't understand fully the Quran and what it's saying and what it's alluding to without strong knowledge of the Bible. And that's what I'm going to get to later. But four benefits of the pre-canonical approach. First of all, we can understand chron chronological development a little bit better. We can um, establish a better chronological sequence of the surahs to see how they developed over time. Uh, example of that, the question of uh, Muslims, of course, do not uh, drink wine. Um, there is one particular verse in there uh, 2, 219, which it doesn't affirm wine, but it condones the practice, it acknowledges that people drink. Um, but that is um, abrogated in 593. It says in 593 that uh, uh, drinking alcohol is a sin. And so we know, based on historical development, this is a later text to be revealed uh, in the context of history. So this is one particular value. A second value is that we can appreciate the literary structure of the Quran. The Quran can be understood internally on its own by using uh, specific structures, its own literary ideas about the way it should be constructed. And what the, what's interesting here is that it shares many similarities with the Bible, um, the structure of the chiasm. Uh, those of you who have ever taken a course on the Old Testament or New Testament are familiar perhaps with the principle of a chiasm. A chiasm starts with a particular principle, and then it gives specific examples moves to a, a ring. It's kind of like a ring structure. It moves to a central theme, and then it moves back out. So you'd have like A, B, C, then you would have D as your, your ring, your center of your ring, and then you would have C1, B1, A1, returning back to those themes. And so each, each issue, a good example of this would be uh, John chapter 1. Uh, the, the introduction to the Gospel of John does the same thing. Many of these surahs in the Qur'an are based on this same Semitic, this common Semitic um, structure of a ring. And so what it tends to do is present uh, a theological theme, an issue to be discussed. Then it tells a story. Very oftentimes these stories are biblical stories or stories that we find in Jewish Midrash or early Christian literature. Then it will go back to confirm the revelation which it's been given and then reaffirm the theological theme that it started with. So the structure and the literary merit of the Quran can be seen through a pre-canonical historical approach. A third value is intertextuality. That is, when we read the Quran along with the Bible, we can see its relationship um, of one literary text to another. Uh, we can see that the Qur'an is a 7th century text, that it shares with many other 7th century texts um, a, a number of interests, a number of themes, and that we can see how it revises or reinterprets earlier texts, whether those are the Bible or they are um, texts from late antiquity belonging to the Jewish or Christian communities. And a fourth benefit is the idea of a historical context. When we look at specific passages, sometimes certain passages tell us about what's going on in the community. And so they can tell us a little bit about uh, the time period and the history of the development of the Islamic community. The Quran as it developed, um, as I mentioned, was revealed probably around 610 to 632. 
We think that Muhammad died around 632. We know that the revelations were oral. Some of them might have been written down in pieces. On Sometimes it says on bones or on stones, uh, but nothing is a full, co complete collection. There was no book during Muhammad's lifetime. And it's only after uh, many people who had memorized the Quran began to die that they began to realize, hey, we need to set this down in writing. And so there are two traditions, one that says that the first caliph, Abu Bakr, ordered a collection of the revelations. There's another one that puts it a little bit later under the caliph Uthman, who called for a um, collection, a standardized text by Zayd ibn Thabit, and also the tradition that he ordered all variant texts of the Quran to be burned. So this might be another issue why we don't have a lot of variant texts of the Quran, because uh, they're no longer with us. One of the issues that we've got uh, with this is that despite the fact that there was this uh, putting together of a standardized version of the Quran, perhaps within uh, two decades of Muhammad's death, we still see a number of variants in the manuscripts that we have today. And it indicates that there was, still was, even in the early Islamic community, a diversity in understanding the Quran. Examples. We have some different orders of surahs in, the, in uh, different manuscripts of the Quran. We have examples of some surahs that have different titles. Uh, for instance, uh, the, one of the well-known surahs, the 19th one, is called Surah Maryam, Mary. Um, but the, the name of it in the Abbasid era, we know, was in, in many early texts is Surah Isa, or Jesus. So the name of this surah was changed. Another example would be that some surahs are absent in early Quran texts. Uh, the first surah in the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, is uh, considered, is done at every prayer time by Muslims. It's the equivalent of the Lord's Prayer in, in Islamic prayer. At every, every prayer during the five times during the day that prayer is given, one always recites this prayer. Well, in some early manuscripts, it's not in there. Um, it's a little bit different than other surahs because most of the other ones um, have the context of God telling Muhammad what to say to his audience. Well, the first surah doesn't do that. It has a completely different, it's assumption of it's a direct prayer up to God. And so many people see this as a liturgical addition to uh, the early Quran manuscripts. Um, we also have instances of some verses that are omitted or deleted. So what we see in examples here, we see emendations, that is, changes sometimes to the Quran. We also see sometimes rearrangement of passages by scribes. Um, we see additions and deletions as well. Um, and sometimes we see interpolations uh, into um, sections themselves. An example of this in 7431, there is a surah, and we see the ring structure perfectly, but then there's this really odd verse in here which doesn't fit the ring structure at all. We think that's an interpolation into it to help with the context of um, understanding the, the, um, the, the, the verse in a wider context, but it probably wasn't part of the, the poetry because it doesn't fit. So... How do you put that all together? How, how, okay, how do you make sense of all of this? Uh, there is no critical edition of the Quran. What is used today is the standard Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian edition, which was established in the early 20th century. So um, in the Islamic tradition, most Muslims who are Sunni are going to use the Egyptian one. But again, there is no critical edition yet. There is a group uh, working in Berlin. Uh, it's called the Corpus Quranicum. And they're working on a critical edition of this, trying to assemble together all of these and actually get it in one book so that you can look through the footnotes and say, this is where this is different, and so on and so forth. But um, this is still a work in progress that hopefully we'll see by 2020, but maybe not until later. One of the conclusions about this is, what's interesting is that revisions tell us that the Quran uh, developed slowly after the time of Muhammad's death, and it was very much a living text, not just an oral recitation, but a living text as well. Um, and that um, either, either in the hands of uh, his scribes or in the people who had remembered oral traditions and, and added them in, what they thought that Muhammad said. But what's interesting is that the Quran has its own history as a text that formed together. So what does that have to do now with the Bible? How does the Quran understand the Bible? It, it claims to offer an authoritative interpretation of biblical stories. So just like you have, uh, say, an early commentator, John Chrysostom or St. Jerome, they wrote commentaries on the Bible, and they said, well, this particular verse means this or that. Well, you could think of the Quran in some ways as doing the same, the same type of thing. It takes a particular biblical story, it will provide a context or allude to that story, 
But then it will provide an authoritative midrashic interpretation of how, how should we understand that religiously or spiritually for our community. And so um, sometimes what we've noticed is that later interpreters missed this particular nuance. Uh, so by the 8th and 9th centuries, in an Islamic context where the Bible is no longer read, uh, some of these things weren't obvious to the readers in the 8th and 9th centuries. And so what historians are trying to do is now try to recover or uncover some of the, the closer relationship that the Bible and the Quran have with one another. Um, what I'm talking about is not influence. The Christ Christianity did not influence the Quran. That would, uh, see, that would assume that the Quran heard these stories and then just copied them wholesale. But that's not what the Quran is doing. The Quran is consciously reciting biblical stories and then reinterpreting them and offering its own commentary on them for its own um, exegetical purposes. So the Quran is consciously using the Bible for its own end. So, so it's important to understand how it rewrites and reimagines biblical literature. And this is the end point for the relationship between Christians and Muslims and between the Bible and the Quran is the fact that it rewrites uh, large portions of the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Examples. Moses is mentioned 136 times in the Quran. Abraham is mentioned 69 times in the Quran. Mary is mentioned 34 times. Jesus is mentioned 25 times. Muhammad, four times. So the Quran is much more interested in biblical stories than it is in telling stories about the prophet, the one, the one who is giving the stories themselves. So it's very much interested in the Bible. It's interested in the Jewish and Christian holy books. Why? Why would the Quran be so interested in the Bible and retelling the Bible? I think this tells us something important about the Quran and the early Islamic community. That is, the audience of the Quran was a largely Christian audience. Many of the people who were in there, whether they were skeptical or believers, were part of this conversation, this ongoing conversation with the Quran about what it was revealing and whether what it was revealing was truly divine or, or if it wasn't. So this Christian audience and context for the Qur'an is really something important to understand. What's interesting is that many of the instances when the Qur'an talks about the Bible, it tends to, uh, to be seeming to refute a skeptical Christian audience, or a Jewish audience in some cases. Uh, examples of that, some of the critiques that we hear from this, this Christian audience. The Qur'an was not from angels, but it was from a human. The Quran says that this is one of the claims that the skeptical audience says. Uh, the Christians in this audience said the Quran was poetry, not divine revelation. So another accusation that they made, well, this is beautiful poetry, but this isn't revelation. A third thing the Quran tells us about its, its Christian audience that was listening to it um, said, well, the Quran was filled with myths and fairy tales. Um, some of these, probably, from, from a Christian perspective, they liked the biblical stories and the biblical references, but they probably weren't as impressed with some of the references to uh, Arab pagan tales that one finds in there, so they probably were more skeptical of that. A fourth critique we hear is that the Quran was taught to Muhammad by someone else, and he is merely a mouthpiece uh, from a human. And then the fifth thing that we hear from the skeptical Christian audience is the Quran is oral, not written like the Bible. And God's revelation is a written text. It's not something that's orally recited. And since you're orally reciting it, then it's not really authentic revelation. The Quran responds to this by saying, well, no, um, this is kitab. It's, it's book. Uh, it is, in fact, a book. But um, these, are, these are some examples of how, using a historical approach, we can understand the Christians and their mindset of them and how they were um, in a relationship with the Quran and its dialogue. So how does the Quran respond to these, these skeptical um, Jews and Christians in its audience? Um, on the one hand, it says, well, they've got hostile intentions, they're prejudiced, they're insincere, they're perverse, they're argumentative, uh, they're demonic. Uh, so that's one way we have are these, these um, ad hominem attacks against them. But the second approach that the Quran often uses to its, the skeptical um, audience is to point out that the Quran has a lot of parallels with um, the earlier books the prophets, the Taurat, the Torah, the Zubur, the Psalms, and the Injil, the Gospels. And so we know that the Quran wants to see itself as being in harmony with these earlier revelations. So there are many instances, there are uh, a dozen in instances when the Quran says, go and look in the earlier scriptures 
Uh, these revelations that I'm giving you have already been mentioned there. And it tells these biblical stories that are in the Quran often to defend itself. So I'll give you a few examples of that that we have here. First of all, um, the apostles are mentioned in the Quran, the Hawariyun, the, the apostles or, or disciples. Um, in Psalm 78, 19, it says, they insulted God by saying, can God make a table in the desert? And Psalm 78, 19, can God make a table in the desert? What's going on here? This is the time of the Exodus in the Old Testament. And the manna, exactly. This is the time of the manna. The, the Jews are wandering in the desert. They're hungry. They're thirsty. They're not getting provided for. And so they ask for God to make them a table in the desert. That is, provide with them. And so God does. He provides them with manna. So those Jews, though, in the story, well, here they are. They're questioning God. They're questioning that God is going to provide them with uh, what, what of, course, of course God provides. God provides in abundance. This is not a life of scarcity, but a life of abundance when one lives a life in Christ. So um, the Jews here are not believing as well in Psalm 78 and also in the context of this story. Now let's look at that story in the New Testament. John chapter 6. This is the, uh, the chapter on the Eucharist and the bread of life discourse. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we might see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So here we have one story in the Jews. The manna is the bread. We go to the next story. Now we have Jesus saying, well, he gave manna to them, but now I am the bread. I am the bread of life. Now the Quran, how does that deal with it? Quran in Surah 5, um, Al-Ma'idah, which is the surah, the, the title of it is the table. So it's, it's named after, after this. So the Quran, as it's written down, already is aware of these passages. It knows that it's talking about this table. So it's aware of this, this biblical resonance is there. It says, Jesus said, And when I inspired the apostles, saying, Believe in me and my messenger, they replied, We believe, so bear witness that we submit. And, that, uh, and when the apostles said, Jesus, son of Mary, is your Lord able to bring down for us a table out of heaven? He replied, Fear God if you are believers. And they said, we would like to eat from it so that our hearts may be reassured and know that you have told us the truth. Now, what has the Quran done here? The Quran knows about the table. It knows about the coming down of a special thing. And it knows that Jesus has reinterpreted the table and the manna to refer to him. It's taken the older stories from the Exodus and from the Psalms, and it's taken Jesus and now put, the, put an Old Testament interpretation back into it, taking out the references to Jesus as the bread of life, and now reinterpreted it so that Jesus is understanding it more in an Old Testament way, that um, the apostles are now the ones who are like the unbelieving Jews earlier. They don't really trust Jesus exactly, so they want, they want the actual table. So this is an example of how the Quran takes Old Testament stories, New Testament stories, and then reinterprets them to fit its own theological agenda, which is to deny the divinity of Jesus. That's why now the bread of life thing is taken out and a new interpretation of those passages is added to it. So that's one example of how we can see this interaction between Bible and Quran. A second one, the legend of Alexander and Surah, Surah Al-Kaf, the, the story, this is the 18th surah in the Quran. It's called The Cave is the name of it. In the cave, verses 83 through 102, is the legend, uh, the story of the hero, Alexander the Great. He's called uh, Dhul Karnain, the two-horned one in the Quran. He's never mentioned as Alexander specifically. But we know that Alexander was called the two-horned one uh, and he was depicted in history with the horns of Zeus to signify his divinity. And if anyone happens to have any drachma on them, if you pull out your drachma, you'll see uh, from the period of Alexander, uh, you'll see that he's portrayed with horns. So we know that uh, this is uh, referring to, to him. 
Now, in the Quran, uh, in the Quran story, Alexander appears. So uh, the, the two-horned one appears, and he journeys to the western edge of the world. And at the far west, western edge, he finds a muddy spring of death. There's nothing there. If anybody touches the water, they die. So he travels through a wormhole. That's my word, not, not exactly what the Quran uses. But he travels through a wormhole or something to go all the way to the other side of the world, to the eastern edge. And at the eastern edge of the world, he finds people in caves because it's so hot, right? Sun rises in the east, so the further east you go, the hotter it's going to get. And so you, he finds the people in the caves because of this. And then he travels, having gone as, to the far reaches of the west and to the far east, uh, now he travels to the north, uh, up to a mountain pass. And there he hears pleas from the people that barbarians are going to come. And so he builds a wall to keep out all of the barbarian hordes. And then Alexander makes a prophecy that these walls will not fall until judgment day. So the Quran tells this story to us. But why does the Quran tell us this story? Well, it's in the wider context of um, this ring structure that I've talked about. It gives a theological point, then it, it tells a story, and then it's going to um, explain it later on. But what's interesting, why, why this text, why is it there at all? Uh, that's, not in, that's not in the Bible. But this particular text is also found in late antique Syriac Christianity. Um, there is a Syriac apocalyptic text known as the Alexander legend, which was composed probably around 629 to 630 AD. That's really important because uh, it actually mentions a specific date in there, which allows us to date it to within one year there, 629 to 630. We know that the Quran, that Muhammad dies 632. So this, this um, particular surah, this particular part of it, must have been formed in the last couple years of his lifetime. Um, the Alexander legend, well, how does it appear in the Quran? Christians, right? We've got a Christian audience. So what do you do if you're a Christian, you're in Medina, this guy is saying he has a revelation, a recitation. Well, it seems that somebody had got a hold of a, this, this apocalyptic text, a Christian who was a skeptic, brought it up to Muhammad and said, this says that it's got prophecies in it. You tell me, is this true revelation or isn't it? Is this uh, authentically uh, part of God's divine plan or is this purely a, um, a fabrication? And so the Quran is asked to make a judgment upon this particular text. And so it does it by retelling the story of Alexander and um, telling the audience. Uh, now, the story, if you read it in the Quran, isn't going to be exactly clear what's going on. But it assumes that the audience already knows the, the context of the story. So what that tells us is that it reveals that this story and this section of the Quran must have been revealed to a skeptical Christian audience that was challenging its revelation, whether it was authentic or not. And so that's how it made it, its way into there. What this shows us is that when we talk about the relationship between Bible and Quran, we shouldn't just talk about just the Bible. We need to talk about all of Christian literature up through the 7th century, that it's key to understanding uh, the, and understand how the Quran uh, relates to other Christians. So this was a Christian text believed by Syriac Christians, by Eastern Christians, part of their tradition, um, part of a long legacy of Alexander kind of getting baptized uh, posthumously by Christians and seen as, as kind of a legendary hero. And, and so it shows us how the Quran once again is in dialogue with its Christian audience. So what kind of insights do we have? We know that the Quran relies on biblical and post-biblical literature. This also pre uh, presents a second important insight. The Quran assumes that people already know the Bible and Christian literature and that it's dependent upon them for its own authority. So the Quran is dependent upon these particular verses and its commentary on them to explain and legitimate its authority. So practical application. Um, looking at this story and looking at the legend of Alexander, uh, which you can find online on like archive.org, you can type in legend of Alexander, you can find this, um, this text. It was translated into English in, I think, the early, the early 20th century, so you can find um, a mediocre translation of it, but it, it does the job uh, to look at, look at this relationship between the Bible and the Quran in this, in this context. So can the Bible and the Quran both be right? Um, in, this tech, in, the, in the context of understanding the Quran and how it developed, 
It's important for Muslims and for those who look at it theologically to acknowledge the historical approach to the Quran. While a theological approach has value, uh, you also have to look at things historically and understand them um, and understand these arguments because they're, they're serious and valuable arguments. Second of all, um, these arguments point out that to understand the Quran, you've got to understand the Bible and the interpretation of the Bible. So um, these are in increasingly important for people, uh, including Muslims, who want to understand their own holy text. You have to, if, you, if you are a Muslim, you want to understand the Quran, you want to understand its context, then you need to read these biblical texts because they give you the context behind why Muhammad, why these recitations are being given. So they cannot simply be dismissed as, well, they're pre-Islamic. Well, they're, they're the heart of the Quran. The Quran is referring to them. It's part of that. And so um, it's important to understand that um, while the Bible and the Quran are both talking about the same text, though, um, they have very, very different interpretations. And so neither the Bible nor the Quran would want you to say that they both are right. They would say that my interpretation is the correct interpretation. So it's important to take, uh, take away from this first historical reflection the idea that both the truth claims of Christianity and the truth claims of Islam each need to be taken seriously on their own, but they also need to be understood in light of one another uh, and in light of the Christian audience for the Quran. So thank you very much for your attention on this uh, first talk, and we'll talk about practical application in my second talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Bertina. We're going to take a very brief break. Thank you all so much for coming back for the second half. So without further ado, I give you Dr. David Bertina. I, I had a question uh, just before this. I, I was talking about how we need to understand the Quran in the context of a Christian audience. And someone said, well, how, how Christian uh, was the you know, Mecca and Medina? Uh, we know that by the late 4th century, Christian missionaries are throughout the Arabian Peninsula. By the 520s to 540s, we have large populations of Christians throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so before Muhammad's birth, Arab Christianity is the majority religion, 75% plus, in the region of what's today southern Iraq and the, and the Persian Gulf. Uh, that's all the way down from, from southern Iraq, Kuwait, what's today Bahrain, and uh, Dubai. Uh, we have many examples of archaeology going on there now where they're finding monasteries and churches. I've got a lot of information on some of the archaeology that's going on all along the Gulf region from, from top to bottom of churches and stuff that they have. We also know that, that it's a majority, and in fact it's a Christian nation in the south and what's today Yemen. Uh, that was controlled by Ethiopia. Ethiopia uh, influenced the Christianity there. It's the majority religion there. Um, and also in what's southern Palestine, all of that is thoroughly Christian. Uh, there's a, an Arab tribe, the, the Ghassanids uh, of the tribe of Ghassan. They were a Byzantine uh, federati. They remember they were a, an affiliate of the Byzantine Empire. So we have numerous examples throughout the Arabian Peninsula of Arab Christianity, as well as the Ethiopians, uh, which are also involved on the Arabian Peninsula. So to say that Christianity is part of the context of the Quran should not be surprising at all, given the evidence that we're finding in terms of archaeology, in terms of literary texts, and, and what the Quran itself says. So something that should continue to be emphasized in understanding the history and formation of Islam and, and the Quran. So now I want to talk a little bit about the Quran in the light of the Bible and in the light of Christian witness and evangelization. Why do Muslims apostatize from Islam? Why do some Muslims decide to leave Islam? And why should Christians bother to even share the good news with Muslims, uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ? Uh, it's often said Muslims are unconvertible, right? And uh, this, is, this is something that uh, is a, a great challenge. Well, in history, we can find some examples of early converts. Uh, we know in Muhammad's biography, it's mentioned that Ubaidullah, um, was a convert to Christianity after he left Mecca for modern-day Ethiopia. Uh, Yusuf ibn Raja, a 10th century convert uh, from Islam to Christianity in Cairo, actually after converting, uh, became a monk and a priest and even wrote a critique of uh, the Quran and a critique of the Hadith, that is how the, how the Hadith were put together in their authority. 
and the historical context of the Quran. So we even have examples of uh, Muslims writing about their former faith, uh, and, and we find examples of converts uh, within Islamic lands, but also outside of Islamic lands in particular. Today you can think of some examples. Carlos Menem, the president of Argentina from 89 to 99, was originally a Muslim who converted, although um, that was probably much more with political interest in mind to become Catholic in, in, in Argentina. Um, another example would be um, Masab Yusuf, who got a lot of notoriety recently when he left the West Bank for San Diego. Um, he was, wrote this book, Son of Hamas. He was, his father was involved, you know, one of the founders in Hamas. And so um, he, he um, converted to Christianity, and so he's another example of a high-profile convert. Um, another example would be Muhammad Hagazi and his wife in uh, Egypt converted from Islam to Coptic Christianity. They uh, wanted to get their identity cards changed from Muslim to Christian, so, so they wanted to stay in Egypt uh, because they had children. And so they wanted their children to have identity cards that said Christian on them so that they could get baptized and so forth. Um, but the government denied their claim in 2008 to allow them to change their religious identity card, and so that's an ongoing legal issue there. Um, another example of people talking about Muslim conversions to Christianity, you may have heard about Zakaria Boutros, who was a, a former Coptic priest uh, who was often seen on Al Jazeera, and he uh, has a, his own channel now you can find on YouTube and stuff called Al Fadi, which he started in 2011, and it broadcasts throughout the Middle East and North America. And he's spoken of an insider movement uh, where many converts, especially in Egypt, have converted to Christianity, but at the same time they've remained as sort of hidden Christians within the Islamic movement, uh, the Islamic community, because of uh, fear of retribution for their conversions. But all of this is to say that conversions happen, people convert for a, a variety of reasons from anything, from one religion to another, from one religion to no religion, from no religion to Catholicism. So um, what is the approach of Islamic law to conversion? Well, all of the Islamic schools of law agree that converts from Islam are considered Muslim apostates, and all of those traditional Islamic schools of law agree that the punishment for apostasy is death. So one of the contexts, however, of that is that if you look at the Qur'an, there is no specific verse in the Qur'an which mentions that death is required for apostates uh, at all. That issue is not addressed within the Qur'an. Instead, we have two verses in the Hadith, in these oral traditions of the Qur'an, so they come from later centuries, 8th and 9th centuries, uh, which are attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, which argue that there should be death for um, apostates. And these oral traditions are disputable, whether they are actually um, authentic. In fact, the former mufti of Al-Azhar University in Egypt, the preeminent Islamic, Sunni Islamic um, institution, Ali Goma, uh, said that apostasy is a matter that we should leave up to God. It's not up to human courts to decide what somebody's religion is. It's a matter of conscience, and let's leave that to God. So there is an approach um, we find in the Islamic world that is more open towards uh, the concept that we have in the West of uh, freedom of religion, a limited concept of that. What are the common responses to that? Well, uh, why should someone who leaves Islam to become Christian, uh, why should they not be allowed to, to leave that? And one of the things that people, that Christians or other, others have said is that, you know, in, in the second surah in the Quran, uh, in the Kaf, it says, there shall be no compulsion in religion. Well, if there's no compulsion in religion, shouldn't there be no compulsion in someone leaving Islam? So why should Muslims who convert to Christianity face penalties or death? Uh, why should they not have freedom of conscience? Do you believe in the universal application of freedom of conscience, freedom of religion in Muslim majority countries and Muslim minority countries? So these are some of the issues that are going on in terms of conversion in the Islamic world. Therefore, there is an opening for Christians to talk about conversion and to talk, and talk about Christianity with Muslims. As a rule, the Catholic Church continues to be very careful about evangelizing Muslims, especially about baptizing Muslims. If it is done, it's done very discreetly, um, and especially because of fear of repercussions for local Christians. So even if it happens in one location, that could set off violence in other locations. But this is mostly taken for pastoral reasons, right? Not for dogmatic reasons. There's no dogmatic 
uh, rules which you have which say that Christians should not wit witness to Muslims in a similar way that uh, it's a, so it's a different attitude than one would would have say for instance to um, Jews so witness is the same to any human person from this perspective so what are some principles of evangelization principles of witness when we talk about Christians and Muslims in dialogue with one another uh, first principle is equity and this is something Christians and Muslims can agree on uh, Muslims are asked by the Quran to discuss their faith honestly with Christians in 2946 the 29th surah you shall not dispute with the people of the book in any but the best way in the best manner we believe in what he sent down to us and to you our God and your God are one so that's an important starting point an important point in the Quran to bring up at the outset of any particular dialogue is the importance of equity the importance of um, being honest and the importance of commonality a second important principle is the principle of enculturation enculturation is talked about especially by Phil Parshall uh, who's uh, a missionary who's written about this he is not Catholic he's an evangelical uh, so he does have a different perspective than Catholics about this but he uh, says especially that and the important thing that accepting Christianity or Jesus Christ does not mean accepting a Western Western assumptions about culture or Western worldviews instead people should be com comfortable within their own context their own culture their own vocabulary to understand Christianity so one needs to enculturate the gospel message into um, an Islamic vocabulary so that's another argument here it says rather than focusing on refutation the focus should be on love for others a third important principle avoid syncretism and pluralism these two religions are not the same dialogue that happens between Christians is often called ecumenism what's the purpose of ecumenism unity right that, that they may all be one you know that is the prayer that Jesus has for his community obviously um, there's a great sin in the Christian all Christian communities the fact that um, they are not one ecumenism calls for unity but interreligious dialogue can never have the goal of unity because Islam and Christianity make fundamentally different truth claims about what what their religion is about and the way the path to salvation what is the path what is the straight path who is the straight path and so because of this we need to be careful not to just say that the Quran and the Bible are the same or that just because they use the same word that they mean the same thing by that they often use the same word in fact and mean something completely different than one another an example is the Word of God when Christians use the Word of God as a title they mean Jesus Christ they mean somebody who is a, a savior when the Quran uses Word of God it means that Jesus came through God's speech to Mary but this does not give him any special status especially any special divinity so even though they have to use the same words they have different interpretations different meanings and so it's important to avoid um, oversimplification in those matters the fourth principle I mentioned um, equity enculturation avoids syncretism and pluralism um, the fourth fourth principle is read the Quran and the Bible together Christians you know can share the gospel and uh, of course the Quran already assumes that it has a Christian audience many of whom are, are skeptics so Christians should not be afraid to open up the Quran read the Quran understand its context and um, share that material with other Muslims and talk about well what do these mean what does this text mean what does this text mean what how do they share with one another so this on, honest and authentic dialogue requires reading both of the text together so some examples of how the gospel is understood in terms of the Quran um, first of all the Quran understands there's only one true God there's no Trinity God is transcendent and that is while we can know God's will God at the same time in terms of his nature is unknowable of course this contrasts greatly with knowing with saying that God can be known through Jesus Christ through God becoming incarnate with the issue of God being one perfect God uh, one of the things that Christians have responded to with this issue in the Quran is to say that well if God is perfect and unchanging as it says in in the Quran and in, in 4823 then why does God change his words in the Quran why does he abrogate them if he's unchanging another thing that Christians sometimes say about the Trinity is wouldn't it be respectful for Muslims to ask me about what I say what the Trinity is 
wouldn't be respectful to ask me if I believe in three gods or if I believe in monotheism or what I say about that. And instead of assuming what you think I mean, and let me have a voice for saying what, what I intend by it. Instead of assuming, for instance, that uh, one of the issues that comes up is in uh, the fifth surah in the Quran, which mentions Mary as uh, a part of the Trinity, an issue, the issue that comes up. Christians, uh, it's important to mention, do not worship Mary. So it's not uncommon to see Muslims, especially in talks with Catholics, say that um, Catholics worship Mary. So that's something to point out. We venerate Mary, but we do not worship her. We do not think she's part of the Trinity. So these are key things to respond to in terms of the knowledge of God. Is God knowable or unknowable? A good starting point is to ask, well, did Isa al-Masih, did, did Jesus um, teach us to know God in the Quran? How did Jesus know about God? How does he know about God in the Quran when he mentions, mentions things about God? Can Jesus, can Isa bring us closer to knowledge of God since he's a sinless prophet and he's with God in heaven? So these are some ways to talk about and respond to issues of God. Another key issue that often comes up in dialogues between Christians and Muslims is the principle of the Quran as inerrant and the perfect word of God. And I've already talked about the historical development of it. But the Quran also, uh, in interpretation by Muslims, is that the Bible is corrupt. And the Bible is only truthful in parts where it confirms the Quran. So how do you respond to that approach? Well, in 1094, in the 10th surah in the Quran, verse 94, Allah, God, tells Muhammad, if you doubt what we have revealed to you, ask those who have read the scriptures before you. So God here is telling Muhammad, if you doubt what's being revealed, ask those who have already had scriptures revealed to them. Here the Quran is expressly telling Muhammad to ask people about the Bible. Why would God ask them, ask Muhammad to go check the earlier scriptures if there is not some authority attached to them? So this is one of the issues. This is not so much to defend the Bible because the point is not to get in a refutation or in an argument. The point is that in order to share and read both the Quran and the Bible at the same time, you have to open up a way. And this is a great way. Well, if Muhammad was asked by God to go read the scriptures, why don't we go read the scriptures together too? I've got them right here. Let's talk about them. So this is a good way to open up a dialogue is through this particular verse and through discussing the text. Well, let's talk about these texts. In fact, um, there are a dozen instances where the Quran mentions that there are earlier scriptures and they, that they have value to them. So um, this is another important point to take in terms of shouldn't we just read the Bible in the same way that Muhammad was told to do by God? Another key issue is the concept of original sin. You know, we understand that within the Quran, God forgives Adam. Within the Bible, God forgives Adam again. But in the same way, there is no concept of original sin, which means that there is no need for a savior. If you have no sin, you have no need for a savior. So if Adam's sin did not come down to us, then the idea of a sacrifice is rendered meaningless. And so this is one of the reasons why um, the understanding of Jesus is not so pronounced or why his divinity is denounced in the Quran. Um, one of the things to talk about in response to this issue of, well, if we don't have sin, then you know, how, do you, how do you respond to that, is to um, look especially at the issue of what's called Eid al-Adha. This is the great, one of the great feasts, uh, a sacrifice in the Islamic tradition. It recalls the story of Abraham who is called by God to sacrifice his son. And then, of course, at the end, that is, that's prevented, and instead there is a feast commemorating that. And so that's within the Old Testament. That's also within the Quran as well, that same story. That's another example of where Genesis chapter 22 and the story of Abraham uh, is also presented in the Quran. And so that particular feast, that particular story in the Quran, is remembered today through um, the feast days where there is the sacrifice of an animal. And that oftentimes is done with the animal which um, will be set up. And it acts in the same way as it did in the Old Testament in Judaism as kind of a scapegoat. In many cases, a Muslim family will have the animal. And um, before, before the sacrifice is done, they will have a list of prayers, prayers for people um, prayers for thanksgiving, prayers for forgiveness. And so then the animal is, is killed, 
and then the meat is distributed you know, for the family to, to others. It's given through almsgiving. But through this, there is a concept of sacrifice within the Islamic tradition. And so that can be a good starting point for talking about Jesus. Because Isa, right, is understood as, a, as somebody who um, is the ultimate atonement. He is the one who's atoned for sin. So one of the biggest issues is talking about, well, how do we get to the need for a sacrifice? And, and so one of the questions you can, you can talk about is, well, why does Eid al-Adha, why do this? Why continue to have a sacrifice? What is the purpose of a sacrifice? What value does sacrifice have? Um, how do we get to God? Does, this, does doing this action guarantee salvation? What guarantees salvation? How do you know that you go there? So these are kind of questions that can bring people into dialogue with one another about Isa al-Masih, about Jesus, and understanding his, his passion, his death, and his resurrection. Another key issue is that interpreters, the Islamic tradition, interprets that Jesus did not die on the cross. And Jesus did not rise from the dead. If he didn't die on the cross, of course, he couldn't have risen from the dead. This comes from the fourth surah in the Quran, 157, 158. And of course, and throughout, it also mentions Jesus is not God. Jesus is not divine. So anyone that says that Jesus is God has ascribed partners to God. They've become a mushrik. That is, they've, uh, they've, they've added partners. So they're no longer a monotheist. So they've fallen into sin. <coughs> One of the key issues here um, that an historical approach can do is talk about this particular verse in the Quran. Um, some people argue that, I won't get into the details of this, but um, it's not exactly clear if the Quran says that Jesus did not die on the cross. It does definitely say that the Jews were not responsible for Jesus dying upon the cross. And so one of the key issues uh, it's one of the things that some Christians have said is, is to bring up, well, Jesus' mother Mary. Mariam, well, wasn't she at the cross? Would she have recognized her own son if it wasn't him that was on the cross, if it was Judas or, some, or Simon of Cyrene or someone else? Why is it that no other sources, no Jewish sources or enemies of Christianity also make this argument? Why is it that we don't find other people um, claiming this? Well, doesn't it make sense to look at outside sources, look at the Bible again, for um, understanding perhaps the context of the crucifixion. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then who was it that kept appearing to the apostles and telling them what to do? Uh, so, uh, so this is a way, again, to start to talk about looking at Jesus, about Isa's death. Jesus' name, I keep saying this, Jesus' name is Isa in the Quran. Isa, Isa al-Masih. Al-Masih is Messiah. Our word Christ comes from that. And so, again, these are entry points to talk about bringing the Bible and the Quran into conversation with one another. Instead of just talking about, well, you disagree with me there, okay. To get beyond that, you have to have the Bible and the Quran. You have to be willing to start to compare them and find points of convergence and find points where you might be able to discuss, well, there's a reason why they don't disagree, but maybe we can move beyond just saying, let's agree to disagree and maybe find out, well, which one seems to have the pro most probability of being right. Um, let's look at some examples of how the Bible and the Quran can interact with one another. I'm going to go back to Surah 18, the cave. This is the one where I mentioned the Alexander legend. Before the Alexander legend, uh, there's a story of Moses. Before that, there is a story of the companions of the cave. The companions of the cave. And so that's why this, the 18 Surah is called uh, the cave is because it's named after this particular story. They're also known in late antique literature as the sleepers of Ephesus. And for those of you who might have ever gone to Turkey and gone to Ephesus, uh, one of the things you can see there are the ruins of a basilica dedicated to the sleepers of Ephesus. And uh, this story is a very common uh, saint's life, lives of these saints. And it appears not only in late antique literature and Syriac and Greek and Latin, and in fact, Gregory of Tours, uh, mentions this story. So it makes its way all the way into Western Europe. Uh, and so it also appears in the Quran. In this story, the Quran recalls this legend. And it says that um, a number of young men took refuge in a cave. And uh, this was because there were persecutions by a Roman emperor during the third century. And the number of men varies according to the different versions of the story. Well, after they went into the cave, 
God made them sleep. He, he cast a sleep over them, and they fell asleep for around 300 years. Again, the exact number varies according to the different variants. There are different versions of the story. According to whatever version of the story, you have different numbers of uh, men in the cave, and you also have a different number of years. This is important because uh, in the Quran, as I'll get to it. Uh, well, after they've slept for 300 or so years, they wake up. They thought they've just slept for the night. They get up. They um, go back into the city of Ephesus, and they're astonished when they find out that everything is completely different. And suddenly there's a cross on the outside of the wall, and there are churches, and what the heck has gone on? Because they had left persecution, and now they're in this great Christian city. And um, the story in the Quran, uh, I've talked about uh, uh, the, the, the chiasm. Um, after this, it closes with a point that um, this demonstrates the truth of the resurrection. So at the start of, of the 18th surah, it says, I'm going to tell you about the, the proof of resurrection, and that not only that there is a resurrection, but the resurrection is bodily, and that, so the resurrection is a real event. So it tells this story, it gives its theological point, then it tells this particular story as its justification, and then it, it connects it, the, the Christian story, with its own interpretation, and then it uh, goes back to this theme of resurrection. This is this structure that, that we see throughout the Quran appearing. Well, why, why is this in the Quran? Once again, there's a Christian audience here. There was apparently an audience member who asked Muhammad, because it says uh, a little bit later, how many sleepers are there? The Quran says in it, right after it tells the story, they say there were three, their dog was the fourth, or they say five, their dog was the sixth. And they say seven, their dog was the eighth. So this skeptical Christian brought up this text and said, look, I've got different versions of it. If you're really hearing from God, if you really know God's divine revelation, which version is right? Which number is right out of these? Tell me. So the Quran mentions this. So we've got the, this preserved dialogue between Muhammad and these skeptics here in the Quran has actually preserved it for us. The Quran says after that, respond, my Lord knows best their number. So God knows best. Uh, no one knows them except for a few. So do not dispute about them except regarding what is clear and do not question regarding any of them. So the Quran says, well, God knows. <laughs> so the exchange, but what, what this is important is it, the exchange reveals how Christians uh, and their texts were being used to challenge the Quran and the Quran preserves them there. It actually gives both voices to it so we can actually look at these actual discussions um, and since there wasn't a consensus in these different Christian versions, it um, allows us to understand a little bit about the Quran, how it claimed to have access to divine knowledge and interpretive authority over Christian texts. If you can really authentically interpret the Bible and tell me what's corrupt or not, tell me which one is corrupt. Uh, so that's what's happening here. Um, this is one way to talk about Christians and Muslims entering into dialogue, is to talk about this text and say, well, can we talk about the historical context of this? Can we, can we talk about this story? Um, why, why is this happening? Why does the Quran contain a saint's life in it? And I'm assuming they say, well, because that story is true. Well, then, does the Quran accept other Christian stories? Uh, that's wonderful. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about Christian ideas. What, what else does the Quran accept? So this is a way for Christians and Muslims to start to talk about their commonalities, how they can um, share in their common texts and reading biblical stories. Another example now. Surah 3, Al-Imran, the family of Imran. And this one is often used to talk about Isa al-Masih, about Jesus. Uh, this is said to have been revealed around the middle of the Medinan period, around 626 or 627 AD. Uh, this is right after the Battle of Uhud, which had happened in 625. And so there's a lot of questioning the future of the Islamic community at this point uh, because of some of the challenges. And so this provides a new interpretation of Mary and the account of her Annunciation. And it favors now a Christian interpretation over a Jewish interpretation of the story of the Annunciation. Why is that important? Well, it tells us again that there's a Christian audience in Medina and that they're there and they're present, both as probably as believers and as skeptics in the Medinan community. What's interesting with Al-Imran, this story, is that it shares a lot of commonalities with it. First, with what you might think is the, the gospel according to Luke but it actually is, fits most closely with the infancy gospel according to James. This is a second century 
um, post-biblical literature, which is part of the Christian tradition. According to tradition, it was written by uh, James, Jesus' older half-brother, uh, one of Joseph's sons from his earlier marriage. More likely, this story stems from the second century, and we know that it was translated into Syriac in the fifth century. I'm using this word Syriac. What is Syriac? Syriac, it is from people who are in the heartland of Syria. Um, it's Christian Aramaic. So it's the dominant dialect of the Middle East before Arabic becomes the dominant dialect after the Arab conquest. Arab Christians, Arabs did not have a written language. Arabic was not written down yet. We have very few examples of it prior to the Quran. So most Arabs, when they learned to read and write, they did not learn to read and write in Arabic, but they were bilingual. They learned to read and write in Christian Aramaic, in Syriac. And so that's not surprising at all that the majority of the literature that the Quran is commenting on is usually found in Christian Aramaic. That doesn't mean that these Christians weren't Arabs, that they were Arabs that were bilingual. This story, we know we have existence, the existence of a 5th century Syriac text of it, so we know that it definitely was around in Arabia around this time period. And what's interesting is the infancy gospel of James itself is retelling a story from 1 Samuel 1, where um, it retells the story of um, Hannah and her prayers for a child. And here you have the story in the infancy gospel of James of Joachim and Anne, of Anna, uh, and their prayers and asking for a child and they, they get married. And so this particular instance, which is interesting for Catholics, um, the account of the Immaculate Conception, which is not biblical in the sense of not being in the Bible, is in the Quran. So that's one of the interesting few exceptions about Mary is that her Immaculate Conception is mentioned in the Quran but not in the Bible. Again, it assumes a Christian audience here who's familiar with this text. So the Christians, the Arab Christians there, are using this text. They clearly think it's authoritative. Um, it validates their Marian veneration. And so in response, the Quran is calling upon this community to join Muhammad's movement because he shares the same values as the people who have this text. I think that's what the context of the, the surah is doing. So uh, one way in which Christians and Muslims can enter into dialogue with this section that talks about Mary and Jesus is um, a few points. Uh, it talks about Mary as being chosen. So it talks about the importance of um, understanding Mary and her role as being specifically chosen. Why does the Quran say she was chosen? That means there's some special status for her. Second of all, angels are speaking to her. It talks about how the angels announce the birth of the Messiah to her by, by Allah, by God. And so we know that Allah, that God has a special purpose for Mary. We know that angels are speaking to Mary. It doesn't mention the specific angel, but the, most interpreters say this is Gabriel, the way that it does in the Bible. The Quran doesn't mention Gabriel by name. Um, a third important point is that it talks right after the Annunciation, it talks about Jesus and what he did. And it briefly mentions that his power is revealed in miracles. It mentions several miracles that Jesus did. So this is another good point of commonality. Well, the Quran says Jesus did miracles. Can we look at where in the Bible Jesus does miracles? Let's talk about that as another common point. Um, and then it talks about Jesus as being risen up by God to heaven. And so this is a way to talk about Jesus as knowing the way to heaven. If Jesus is in heaven with Allah, if Isa is there, then he must know the path to heaven. Can we talk about um, following Jesus as a way to heaven. If it says in there that Mary was chosen and it mentions that Jesus is a word from God, did, does that mean that Jesus has a father? Who is, who is Jesus' father? Who is the father of Isa then in the Quran? Um, this is not, again, not, you don't need to get into refutation because no Muslim is going to say he's, well, God's his father. because they're, So, so that, the, the point is not to trick somebody there. But the point is to get to start to think about, okay, let's think about this then. If Jesus doesn't have a father in the Quran, then what does that imply? How can, how can a Muslim understand that um, in an important way, in a way that makes sense? It has to be logical too. And so in the same way then you have to talk about, well, is it true then that Isa is holy? Isn't he holy then? Uh, did he commit a sin in the Quran? Or is he sinless? And Jesus is sinless, I think. He, and uh, it also mentions that one of the miracles that he did is that he rose people from the dead. He, he was able to uh, allow for a resurrection. And if that's the case, 
then you can talk about, well, does Jesus have power over death in the Quran? Well, yes, if Jesus has power over death, then, then we can talk about another way about Jesus' authority. Jesus is sinless. Jesus has power over death. Jesus does miracles. Um, so there's a lot of ways to talk about him within the context of the Quran. And in 355, in the, the 55th verse in the Quran, it mentions that um, Jesus is brought up. Um, he's uh, mutawafiq. He is caused to die and brought up into heaven by God. If Jesus is in heaven, and uh, we know that he's there with God, he's, know with, he's there with Allah, then can we look at him as the most ideal prophet? Um, who gives us the best path to heaven? Is it Jesus? Is it Isa al-Masih? And of course, you know, a Muslim would say, of course, well, no, it's Muhammad. But um, you can continue to talk about, well, um, what about in 46.9, the 46th surah in the, in the Quran in verse 9, where Muhammad says, I am nothing new among the prophets. What will happen to me and my followers, I do not know. I am only a plain warner. If Muhammad says that about him, how can we talk about Isa in relationship to Muhammad? Where do they stand as prophets? And so this, again, is a way to start talking about the Bible and the Quran together. Some counterexamples. It's not uncommon to have Muslims also come and say, well, I see you're reading a Bible or something. Are you interested in comparative religion? And so there's, you know, the same training goes on in, in the same way in the Islamic community. And so there are certain approaches or questions that are meant to get Christians to slip up if they're not familiar with it. So there are counter arguments where Muslims read the Bible to um, do the same thing. Uh, one of the most common ones is an example of the, is the issue of the Son of God and argue that, well, the Son of God is a title that's not unique. Is Jesus the only one who's called Son of God in the Bible? No. There are other people called Son of God. There are multiple instances of that in the Old Testament. And this is one of those cases where the clear implication of this is that Jesus if he's called son of God, does not mean that he's divine. Just because he's son of God doesn't mean that he's necessarily divine. That's the implication of this. But of course, just like word of God does not mean the same thing in the Quran as it does in the Bible, son of God does not mean the same thing in the context of Jesus as it does within the context of others. Specifically, son of God is by adoption in other instances, and it's eternal in the context of Jesus. And so a good way uh, to respond to the kind of question about that is, well, he's, if he's eternally son of God, not adopted with the way of these other ones, well, let's look at John chapter 1. Let's talk about what this means when it talks about him. So this is also where you get, I am the father and he is in me. We get a lot of important points about that. Uh, another example of this uh, discussion where a Muslim critique of, of Christians might occur is, um, well, Christ raised people from the dead. Yes, we acknowledge that, but didn't Ezekiel do that? Didn't Elijah do that? So isn't he the same as all of the rest of them? Being allowed to um, resurrect people from the dead is just a sign of God's permission. That's just a sign of God's power, not any special sign of Jesus Christ himself, of Isa. One of the responses to that, of course, is that, well, they do similar things, but only Jesus is the only one among those three that you mentioned that claims that he's son of God, that he is eternally divine, and he's also the only one who rose from the dead himself. Why does he rise from the dead? Why in the Quran is he said to be brought up into heaven? Well, I think for our salvation, right? And so if that's the case, then um, why is it, if it's for salvation, what does it mean to be saved? And so um, this is another way to begin to talk about salvation in terms of atonement, in terms of sacrifice, in terms of the passion, and to talk about how, in the same way, well, God killed animals for Adam, for clothing, right? God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. In the same way, Allah, God, has asked Isa to be a sacrifice for him. And that's because of God's great love for us. And so can we talk about this in, in terms of, of sin and salvation? And do you think that you're sinful? How do we atone for sin? How do we make up for our sin? So this is a good way to talk about serious things that people haven't really thought through all the way and engage more deeply in their scriptures. Some conclusions about dialogue between Christians and Muslims, some conclusions about using the Bible and the Quran in an effective way. The purpose has to be to praise and glorify God. If the purpose is to try to convert, uh, then you're not getting very far. The purpose is to witness, simply to explain what you see as the truth. Why? Because conversion is about free will. 
Catholics respect freedom of conscience. We respect freedom of will in the same way we should respect the freedom of conscience, the freedom of will for other people. And we should instead recognize that we live in an imperfect world and that instead we should focus on worshiping God, seeking holiness, and desiring salvation, and talking about how can we be holy? How can we be forgiven sin? How can we be deserving of, uh, and granted the grace of, of salvation by God? The second important thing, there needs to be an emphasis on the mutual seeking of truth. The purpose, again, is to find out and understand more about why this happened. Uh, the purpose isn't uh, like to bring up the story of the sleepers of Ephesus. The story isn't to bring up one upsmanship. Aha, I've got this. The purpose is to say, well, now we can uncover some great history about the Quran. Let's talk about how it got put together. Um, let's seek out the truth of it and not just rely on what we assume or what we hear from other people. Let's, let's seek that out in, in, in history and in texts. The truth is not restricted. The truth belongs to everyone. It's a case of the fact that we need to allow the truth to grasp us. If we try to grasp the truth, then it will elude us. But if we allow the truth to embrace us, then we will, we will be able to be free to um, embrace it. And that's also... Uh, can be a way to move away from um, fear of authorities or fear of radical individuals. A third emphasis that needs to happen is an emphasis on the reality of sin and redemption. Those have to be emphasized on the Christian side using both the Quran and the Bible. Uh, there has to be an explanation of sin, atonement, moving from sacrifice to God's love. If the discussion of God's love through sacrifice, and that God so loved the world that he gives his only son, if that is not there, then Christian witness cannot happen. So it has to be centered on and continually reaffirming Isa al-Masih, Jesus Christ. If he is not the center, then the discussion, the dialogue will not continue far. A fourth important point is the reality of resurrection needs to be emphasized among Christians. And this can be done by perhaps pointing out the ambiguity of the verse that I mentioned earlier. Um, they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him, but it only appeared so to them. What does it mean by it only appeared so to them? What does this mean exactly? These are ways in which Christians and Muslims can enter into dialogue that is not simply about arguments, but it can be about um, real ways that we can open up holy books and we can show how they share texts, how they share ideas, and it can be a way for people to move beyond um, simple disagreements. So um, thank you very much for your attention at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Bertina. I really appreciate, oh, the last five minutes I've just been in my head going, amen, amen. This is great. <laughs> How can you explain uh, the difference between the first part of the Quran, the Mekkite part, which speaks well about Christians and Jews, and the second part of the Quran, which is the Medina part, which speaks badly about the Christians and the Jews. Right, and this is in the first part of my talk when I was talking about this difference between looking at it, theolo you can look at it theologically and then say, well, this part's abrogated by this part, this part's abrogated, and so those parts don't matter. Or we can approach it historically and say this um, reflects the changing relationships that Muhammad had over time with Christians. And I think I see in many Islamic communities, in, in Islamic symposiums I've been involved in uh, academically, uh, many Muslims are willing to revisit the chronology or revisit their interpretation or theory of abrogation to talk about, well, maybe we should focus on the positive verses and not focus on the negative ones. And it's time to reevaluate what abrogation means. So um, in the one on the one hand, we can understand it historically in a fixed way, but we're all human beings living in time, and, and so the texts are static, but we're dynamic. We're, and so people are constantly reinterpreting what it means to be Christian, what it means to be Muslim. So I think that there are some good things happening uh, in, in the Islamic community among Muslims, especially in academia, who are saying, let's, let's talk about these verses in a positive way. Since you talk about the history uh, uh, at the time when the Quran is written, I was interested to know, was there any significant historical event, some war, something that would precipitate Muhammad's writing the Quran as a result of some tectonic cultural shift at the time. Yes, in my book, in chapter two, <laughs> I have, have an idea about that, which is, again, it's a hypothesis. 
Um, I think that what was going on in the Christian East is that you've got these um, different groups. You have the, the Byzantines who are Orthodox. You have um, the Syriac Christians, some of whom are um, what sometimes you got called quote-unquote Nestorian Christians. You also have um, Ethiopian Christians in the area who are quote-unquote, they're sometimes called Monophysite or Oriental Orthodox. So you've got different Christians groups, and they're having Christological disputations. Who is Jesus? Um, the Jews are also entering in this Christological dispute. Well, he's nothing. Uh, and you also have pagans who are dealing with this. And so I think that the Quran is, in, in some ways, its historical context is a response to some of the diverse views that are taking place and some of the intellectual ferment that is taking place not only in Mecca and Medina, but throughout um, the Middle East during this time period. I think that that could be considered possibly a catalyst. That's one of my hypotheses. Again, not, not the fundamental reason, but that's a theory of mine. Um, actually, Dr. Bertena, we've got a question coming in from online. This is Jim. He was wondering, do Muslims believe that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead and then into heaven, or simply that his spirit is in heaven with Allah? This is uh, depending on how uh, Muslims interpret Al-Imran, the third surah in the Quran, verse 55. It hinges on the word mutawafiq, which is, could be interpreted as he was caused to die. It's often used, tawafiq, to, uh, to pass away. Or it could be that he took him up. And so depending on how that particular um, phrase is interpreted, one would think that either he was taken up bodily into heaven, so he was not crucified, and so he remains in heaven until the end of time when he will come down and finally die. That's the dominant view. Or um, if one argues possibly that he did in fact die and that that mutawafiq means that he did die and just that the Jews weren't responsible for it and that he did die and that God rose him up and that's why he's in heaven. How do you respond to the Muslims that are out there that say they are actually both Muslim and Christian? Okay. Um, do, you, do you mean Muslims who consider themselves Christian or Christians who consider themselves Muslim? There is a movement, an insider movement. They call themselves um, Isahi Muslim. Isahi, Jesus, Muslim. Jesus, Muslim. They've submitted to Jesus. And um, these are people who, um, through the reading of the Quran, have come to understand Isa al-Masih as the best path to understanding God. And so they've accepted Jesus, and so they read the Bible and the Quran together, and they're sometimes called Muslim background believers. Some of them continue in their own communities, or they are in house churches, um, and there are examples of these throughout the Middle East. These are in areas in Islamic majority area, in countries. You know, in the West, typically, if a Muslim leaves Islam, they're going to leave for an existing community. So that would be one example as the Isahi Muslim uh, groups. Doctor, since uh, Muslims are adherents to the idea that their faith can be superseded by a book that's come up later, what do you think about using the Book of Mormon to diffuse their idea? Because it's the same kind of thing that just came up 1,100 years later. They often say, you know, have you given, read the, the Quran and given it a chance? Well, you can ask them the same thing about the Book of Mormon. Yeah, uh, and there are lots of uh, apologetics experts who talk about, well, they both proclaim to be prophets, they both proclaimed to have a book. Uh, they both proclaimed to be talking to God. They both were, had multiple wives. Um, they both you know, formed their own sect. They both built their, their own religions off of the, the Bible. So people make those arguments, absolutely, and make those connections. This gets back to a wider point about my talk, though. It's one thing to try to refute Islam, and it's another thing to actually try to talk to Muslims. And so I think it's much more valuable if we can start to talk about creative or effective ways of of dialoguing with one another um, as a way to try to counteract extremism versus um, refutation because I think that I'm not saying that I'm giving that at the expense of truth that's never at the expense of truth in fact it's it's all about truth but I think that this is a way to try to approach it in a way that can be um, more positive and, and um, if people in Islamic community see positive examples then that can try to diffuse extremism to a certain extent so certainly I see those those links uh, but I don't always know if making those links is going to be effective in, in any type of discussions with, with Muslims. 
I've, uh, in the past, worked for the FBI. Mm -hmm. And the FBI came over not too long ago at the mosque on King Street, which is not far from here, and took away two Muslims that were praying the Quran. And I would have to know a Muslim really, really, really good, like family, before I discuss religion. And it's a shame. Mm -hmm. It's really a shame. I think mm -hmm. there would be more understanding. Because okay. I don't hear any condemnation from Muslim leaders about these fanatics that are killing thousands of people. I think that, and I hope that, um, both Christians and Muslims would be willing to have discussions about their faith, not only in a church, but in a mosque. And so, if there are opportunities to um, encourage uh, discussions at local mosques, that, that would be a good thing. Of course, I'm in Springfield. We have one mosque there, uh, and so it's very ethnically diverse. There are people from all over. Um, but and and I'm I know the imam there, but it's and so there's a very different situation than what you have here in Washington D.C. But um, certainly there are opportunities there for for that dialogue. And that gets to my what I wrote up here, and uh, this is related to the issue of the Boston Marathon and the bombings there, because I know right we have to talk about that question anyways, even if it hasn't come up yet, is understanding certain things are invariable, certain things are contingent, certain things uh, happen regardless. Certain things are dependent. Human nature is invariable. No matter where you go, in what place of time, humans are good and humans are sinful. Humans do good things, humans do bad things. So therefore, it's important. This is one of the things that atheist arguments use against Christianity. They say, well, the Crusades, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, Catholicism is evil. Well, no, human nature is good and evil. But that, that's, that's an invariable. That doesn't have to do with religion. Religion is a contingent. Not only religion, but anything that's an ism. I don't mean ism in a bad thing, but Islamism, um, capitalism, communism, anything that's an ism, an ideology, is a contingent. That, is, that means there are humans in there who are good and bad, who can do good or do bad within that. I think the only difference is certain contingencies can allow for more extremism than others in certain points in time. So, for instance, Islam, in certain points in history, as a contingent, was much more open to tolerance. Uh, I would say, actually, today, in some ways, in many places, it's more open to tolerance than in previous ages. In some periods, it's more tolerant. In some periods, it's less tolerant. But humans are still humans, and we can't change that. So I think it is important to acknowledge that because it also defends Christians, as well as Muslims, against attacks from, from non-believers who try to say that religion is inherently evil. So... Thank you so much, Doctor. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635. 7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.